welcome and good morning to the, or good morning and welcome to the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory live stream lecture. My name is Julian. I'm going to try to set up the camera in a way that works for everyone. Sorry about that. We are in currently in Oakland, California, a beautiful sun kissed morning over here. There we go. That looks a lot better. Okay. We are properly set up. I am so glad that you are here. It is a gorgeous, sunny, cool morning in Oakland where I will be staying for the next two weeks. This is going to be the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory live stream lecture, which if you're new here, I've been recording for the past two and a half years. I used to work as an educator at the University of London, as well as at the University of Oxford Brookes. And during the pandemic, I started live streaming some of my lectures. And since then I've started doing that full time. Uh, I'm currently in California. Oakland is in California. It is in the Bay Area, close to San Francisco, since I'm seeing a question about that in the comments. Um, please let me know where you're joining me from. That always gives me immense pleasure to know that we are connected around the world through digital and philosophical means. Always very happy to hear where you guys are joining me from. I can currently only see the Instagram screen, but I can make out some comments on YouTube as well. Um, but please do let me know where you're joining me from. It makes me very, very happy. And if you are watching on, actually, I can see YouTube here, Hungary. Hello, Hungary. Good morning, Hungary. Good morning, China. Mozambique, India. Hello, hello. That is absolutely wonderful. China as well. Such a pleasure to have Chinese students this week. Greece, Canada, Algeria, Belarus, Brazil. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you're watching on Instagram, there should be a new feature on the live stream where you can, if you'd like to make a donation to this lecture, you can actually become a $5 paying member. I'm not sure where the button is, but that's something I'm told works now. So uh, please consider that. It's like in church, you know, you pass around the, the, oh, excuse me. I'm not sure what the technical term is for the donation basket. Um, but yeah. I'm going to be spending about 45 minutes. I see, I see everybody here, India, Ethiopia, Sweden, Malaysia. That makes me very, very happy. Um, so the basic premise of this lecture series is to take some of the ideas within so-called continental philosophy and theory and to make them a little bit more accessible to you and hopefully to make them an entry point into your own reading. So today we're going to be talking about Alain Badieu, who's a French philosopher, his theory of the event, how he relates that to love, how he describes love as a truth event. Along the way, I want to talk about Pride and Prejudice. I'd like to talk about something I read about Monet, the artist. Uh, we can talk a little bit about art as a form of truth event. We can talk about the Brechtian third thing. And perhaps we'll also talk a little bit about Slavoj Žižek's theory that love is a violent event and how we should interpret the idea of violence when it comes to love in a not physical sense, but perhaps in a more psychic sense. So if you'd like to learn more about those topics, please, please make yourself comfortable. We're going to be here for about 45 minutes or so. Uh, and as always, these lectures are entirely open access and free. Anybody can join me. That's the whole point. I believe that learning should be accessible. I believe that anybody should be able to participate. I don't think that we should gatekeep or paywall um, educational access. However, that being said, if you would like to support this project, if you'd like to support my dream, please consider becoming either a paying Instagram subscriber or a paying patron. It starts at just $5 a month, and that gets you access to our Discord server, a weekly bonus podcast. And if you are on Patreon, you can also get uh, edited transcripts for every lecture that I've ever recorded, ad-free downloads for every lecture I've ever recorded, which at this point are more than 100, so that should keep you busy for a while and my ebook introduction to Slavoj Žižek. The ebook functions as a quarterly subscription service. So after every lecture series, you can download the corresponding ebook. The current lecture series that we're sort of halfway through right now is called The Divine Madness. And I'll try to relate this lecture back to that topic, but it can be enjoyed standalone. That's very important to me. Uh, this is what I like to refer to as the dialectical method of teaching where which is a bit pretentious, I understand, but it's something that I take from the philosopher and literary critic Frederick Jameson, who himself sees him, who's always seen himself primarily as an educator. 
And the dialectical method in education is not just about directly relaying information so that you could simply you know, download the accompanying PowerPoint and not actually listen to the lecture. Instead, it's about synthesizing ideas and concepts together in a way that will make more sense the longer you participate. Because you, it's the same like with a joke, where by the end of the joke, you understand the punchline because you can, in your head, retroactively piece together all the other pieces. That's how dialectical education functions. The more you participate, the more you start being able to make these connections on your own, which I believe is more enriching and also more, like, more likely to allow you to remember and hold on to these concepts. So that is the, that is the idea. Okay, let's begin. <clears throat> so, Alain Badiou is a French philosopher, one of the primary influences, for example, on Slavoj Žižek. And one of Alain Badiou's key ideas is what he calls a truth event. In fact, Badiou argues that a truth event is essentially the essence or the core of how all meaning is created, how all philosophy comes to us, that philosophy revolves around what he calls truth events. And one such truth event for Alain Bajo is falling in love, the fall into love. And here one should be very specific and emphasize that Bajo says that it really requires this fall, subjective destitution, as I like to call it, that you're going about your day and you're sort of not paying attention and then suddenly you slip or you trip and you fall. And in the exact same way that when you fall, it happens so quickly and suddenly the world seems upside down. In the same way, falling in love can be this kind of subjective reversal, that you're going about your daily life and all of a sudden everything appears to you in a different light. Now, for a long bajo, this isn't just a simple observation about falling in love, which anyone could sort of make. Instead, he relates it to an entire philosophical system that he has, where this fall into love, which might appear a kind of subjective submission to an external circumstance, a contingency, if you will, an accident, is in fact something that reveals an inner necessity. Now, the more technical philosophical way of referring to that is the idea of the, uh, the contingency of necessity. Or if you want to make the full dialectical inversion, you could also, in a Hegelian sense, say the necessity of contingency itself which is a fancy way of saying that accident and fate are not two opposite things, at least not for Badiou. Instead, fate reveals itself only by accident. It is a kind of fated accident. Now, you might ask yourself at that point, why aren't these things antithetical? How can you deem an accident something that has to be fated? Wouldn't that be a contradiction in terms? Well. To use an example that might illustrate how they actually overlap, you could think about how most couples, even though they know that they're living with a complete stranger, somebody that you know was completely accidental that they met them, it could have been any other guy they met on the train or on the bar or at the bookstore, and yet somehow it feels to them as if it were meant to be. In fact, that one of the signs of being in love with someone is that even though you know perfectly well that it could have happened otherwise, that you could have gone through the sliding doors of life and found a different partner and been equally happy, perhaps even more happy, that you tell yourself that it was meant to be. And in fact, for Bajo, this is what it means when something is meant to be. It's not that you're simply deluding yourself. It's that everything that is meant to be is the retroactive embrace or recognition, if you will, of necessity in contingency. Something which happened accidentally is experienced and accepted as something that had to occur. Of course, for Bajou, this has to happen retroactively. You can't simply walk into life and say, I have to meet someone today, and so it's gonna happen by accident. It's rather the other way around. It's that you don't know when you're going to meet someone, and yet when it occurs, it appears to you as if everything in your life up until then had been leading up to that pivotal moment, that event. Now, this is actually where I wanted to bring in Pride and Prejudice, because I think that Pride and Prejudice relates very well to the Bourdieu idea of love as an event, a truth encounter. And before you start thinking that Bourdieu is simply saying that there's one person out there for you, and as soon as you see them, you know that they're the one that you were meant to spend the rest of your life with, we should take a closer look at what happens in Pride and Prejudice. <clears throat> the central 
lesson of Pride and Prejudice, if there is one. Oscar Wilde, of course, famously quipped in the trial against him that literature knows, knows, knows no lessons and sends no messages. But if there is a central, let's say, analytic component that we can derive from Pride and Prejudice, it would be that love never happens directly. That love isn't simply the recognition of two people who are perfectly compatible with each, with each other. Instead, spoilers for Pride and Prejudice, what we require is a kind of fundamental misrecognition where the step towards love is in fact not liking each other. Now, of course, this, this can also appear as a literary trope. Anyone who's read a romance novel, uh, certainly of the, let's say, more affordable, cheaper variety will know that enemy from going from enemies to lovers is one of the um, standard formulas of financial success when it comes to, when it comes to romantic novels. Um, and yet what happens within Pride and Prejudice is that this misrecognition is in fact entirely key and necessary to the ultimate recognition of the partner as such. In fact, that if Mr. Darcy simply appeared on the stage as the um, quotidian nice guy, that it is very likely that we would not have the romantic unfolding that we do. And so this misrecognition, this initial stage of this person is so horrid, and yet in a sense they fascinated me by, by being so horrid, is therefore a kind of necessary detour for the ultimate requital of the mutual love interest. And the love interest wouldn't be able to occur without it. Here we already see a, a, a problem, but an interesting one within the idea of the contingency of necessity, namely the accident of necessity, which is to say that if you meet someone and you simply don't like them, and you're not compatible, then strictly speaking, this doesn't mean that you are destined to be together. That would, of course, would be a horrible reading of Pride and Prejudice would be to say, well, we have to make marriages of convenience where the person who can bail out our family members through means of finance are the ones we should spend the rest of our life with. In this cynical sense, you could read Pride and Prejudice as a sort of retroactive papering over of the, the financial necessity of the arranged marriage. But but that would be very untrue to the spirit of the novel, I believe. Instead, it's about saying that the first impression is not necessarily the same impression as the impression of falling in love. That the process of falling in love can actually be the overcoming of the first impression. That if you meet somebody who's too desperate to like you or to be liked by you, who's doing everything in their power to make you make themselves desirable for you, that this can be an obstacle or a barrier to love. That ironically, engaging with someone in a non-dependent manner is a much more, let's say, fruitful way to fall in love and to be loved by them. It's also why I believe it was Pushkin who wrote that the easiest way to seduce someone is to not try to seduce them at all. Of course, I'm not trying to advocate that um, we should write a Pushkin, Pride and Prejudice, Rules to the Game type book that would be truly vulgar. Um, instead, to go back to Alain Badiou's argument about the necessity of contingency, it's that love, therefore, is retroactively experienced as something that had to happen. And yet it's not simply that when you meet, that you immediately have the star, you know, the two eyes that cross each other, the star-crossed lovers, the, the Cupid's arrow that emerges, whereby you become the slave to love. In fact, it's quite important to note that Bajou's theory of love is entirely emancipatory, by which I mean that it is entirely liberating for individual subjectivity to make this misrecognition. Hence also why Pride and Prejudice is a deeply empowering work. In fact, one, one could argue an entirely feminist work by which the protagonist has the independence, the intelligence, the insights, the emotional maturity to not immediately leap into the arms of the first man who gazes at her either affectionately or disaffectionately. In fact, the irony, if you will, of Pride and Prejudice is that the union is so perfect because neither of them need the other, that there's a kind of alignment there of two independent, mature, emotionally capable human beings. <clears throat> now, I want to briefly return here to Alain Badiou's theory of love. Remember Alain Badiou said that love requires the fall. In fact, he argues that love wouldn't be love without this fall. This means that there is a dangerous element to love. Of course, this is something that everyone understands, that love is both that which can save you, it can redeem you, it can 
brighten your life, but it can also destroy you, it can wound you, it can leave you at your absolute lowest point. Um, I can't remember who the quote is by. I hesitate to attribute it to, to anyone if I can't say. It's one of the 19th century French writers who said that there's more truth to the bottom than there is to the top. And this is the kind of truth that the love event presents. The truth of being at the bottom. Now, not simply the bottom of they've left you or they betrayed you or the bottom of unrequited love, which is its own particular pain, but specifically the bottom of having fallen in love in the first place. In fact, one could make the argument that it's a perfectly reasonable way to spend one's life to avoid this fall as much as possible, to hold on to one's own particular subjective stance, thereby risking nothing and gaining everything. It's also why the first encounter with love whether it's simply the physical desire that the teenager experiences or if it's the amorous fantasies that, that accompany it quickly can be very quickly debilitating, can be a kind of symptom, if you will, of the adolescent trying to find his way into life rather than a sign of their maturity. There's a great line about this from um, Stephen Fry, a uh, noted actor, comedian, author. And Stephen Fry said that no love of his has ever been more intense and yet less true than his first love. And I find that to be quite profound because I think this is very often true, that the first time one tastes of the particular intoxicant that is love, one feels absolutely consumed and devoured. It's a fire that burns very brightly within one. And yet this love, this initiation into love, isn't necessarily always love. It can be a, an infatuation, it can be a discovery. And it often comes with the most pleasure and with the most pain. But for many people, it's also not their final love. Now, of course, if you end up marrying the person that you fell in love with when you were <clears throat> 10 years old or, uh, and you're happy with them, that shouldn't in any way devalue that experience. If anything, that's truly courageous and romantic. Uh, but instead, it's about saying that love can present itself to us as a kind of delirium, as a kind of absolute subjective destitution, and that this happens primarily when you first fall into love. Hence why the fundamental hysterical question which someone like Lacan, the psych French psychoanalyst, would call the central subjective question, in other words, the, the truth of all subjectivity, is the question, do they really love me? Of course, we can go all the way back to you know Shakespeare, etc. Do they love me? Do they love me not? Pulling off the petals off the, off the flower, etc. But that falling in love is therefore the emergence of a hysterical stance towards the other. Namely, what is the other to me? What am I to the other? What do I need to do to impress the other or to have the other? And how am I still myself if I am no longer without, if I am no longer with the other? I posted this recently on Instagram. I thought this was a fantastic quote from the French, uh, French author, uh, the Goncourt, who said that falling in love, therefore, feels like uh, when, one, when one is a volume, uh, a two book volume in which one book is missing. And he also defined love, therefore, as incompleteness in absence, that he felt incomplete if his lover, his loved one, was absent. This is, of course, not a pleasurable state to be in, to feel like one has forfeit one part of oneself. It's also why Plato called um, love something which could turn men into fools, that it, in a sense, robbed them of their instincts, of their wit, of their reason, that it made them do things that they otherwise wouldn't. And yet, in a sense, it's precisely the fool who believes himself to be immune or above love. It's like Lacan has this line where he says that the ultimate fool is the king who believes himself to be king. And in this sense, you could say the ultimate fool is the man who believes that he will never love or will never be loved by someone. Now, all of this brings me back to the philosophical point of love with or without the fall. That love is therefore a truth event. And what Bajo means by a truth event is very simple, which is, I mean, has complicated consequences, but the meaning is simple, which is to say, when you fall in love, it reveals a truth about yourself. That in a sense, you become your truest self when you fall in love. And yet what's fundamental here is that it's a, not a linear progression. It's not, I used to be fake and now I'm real. 
And said it's that the previous version of you is entirely real, authentic, whatever word you want to use. But what the previous you doesn't have is the submission to an other, this hysterical attitude towards some other entity. The paradoxical situation is therefore that when you fall in love, you become willing to completely submit yourself to someone. And yet when you submit yourself to them, you also feel like you've unlocked your truest and best self, to put it in contemporary terms, that you engage more directly with the world. It's a, it's a classic truism about love that when you, when you are in love, that, that you know, the sun shines brighter, that food tastes better. Uh, for me in contemporary terms, movies are funnier to watch. There's a great uh, quote from the fashion designer Karl Lagerfeld, who famously spent his entire life uh, single, uh, or, or we believe to be single, uh, after his early romantic partner uh, passed away as a young man. And he said that he almost never watched movies at home because he believed that watching movies was something that should be done with other people. And it's, it's a beautiful idea, right? That to watch a movie is something that is more enjoyable when you do it with others. And that, for example, when you go to the cinema that you're actually enjoying the presence and the reaction of others. Although I'm sure plenty of people would disagree with me here by saying that others are uh, disruptive when it comes to movies. But to my mind, it's like going to the theater or going to the opera, that a key part of what makes it enjoyable is the interaction that you have with the audience. Perhaps you could make the ar same argument for <clears throat> the sports arena as well, where this is simply uh, elevated to a higher pitch of intensity. Now, what Bajir therefore means is that when you fall in love, when you experience the subjective destitution, when you experience the full realization of the double meaning of the word subject, namely that you are both subject in yourself, in itself, but you are also sub, you become subject for itself by means of being subject to someone. That what happens in love therefore is that you fall into the other, you fall in love, and yet in a strange sense, you are falling into yourself. It is a process of self-discovery. It is a process of self-learning. Again, to put it in slightly more contemporary terms that might perhaps be misinterpreted as being self-help, even though they are philosophical. Although I believe that philosophy uh, is perhaps the best way to help oneself, but that's my own inclination. <clears throat> now, what this means therefore is that to be subject is to be subject to someone. That in love, one becomes, to put it almost in Christian terms, subject to another. And this back and forth, this interpassive subjectivity, is therefore precisely no longer interactive. Interactive subjectivity would imply that you're simply corresponding with people, but you're not intimately engaged with them. For example, a key interactive engagement or participation is any commercial participation. When you pay someone to do something, even if you're polite about it, even if you, you know, enjoy learning where they're from or, or whatever, like you have a pleasant, polite interaction, it means that, strictly speaking, you are exchanging a service for each other and that this service is underwritten by a financial exchange. This is also why, for example, Marx, and this is something that people don't always realize about Marxism, is Marx is not anti-money specifically. First of all, Marx isn't anti-anything. This would be a deeply normative way of viewing the world. The critique of Marxism is not normative. It's many people interpret it as capitalism is bad, communism is good, and that's so far removed from Marx's argument, which was never simply about, you know, boo-booing capitalism. Instead, it was about examining some of the fundamental impossibilities, contradictions, inevitabilities for Marx that he saw within the mechanical mode of reproduction in capitalism. But that's for another time. Anyway, Marx believed that money was in fact something quite emancipatory. After all, think about it, money allows anyone to act like a lord. If you have sufficient money, you can buy pretty much anything, as the saying goes. And so it means that it doesn't really matter where you're from, what your class is, what your status is. In a feudal system, for example, you would have to ask permission to leave your city or to leave your region. I mean, imagine today being an artist and you wanna go on tour and you would have to write to the local Lord to ask them whether you would be allowed to leave. It's, it's totally mind boggling. Whereas now, of course, with money, 
and free trade of uh, goods, etc. You can simply buy yourself a ticket and you can go and perform and sell merch, etc. And so Marx actually believed that money was supposed to be something liberating. It was something that allowed interactive exchanges to occur. What happens in love, however, to return to the topic, is that we go from an interactive exchange towards an interpassive exchange, which is to say when you're in love, it's not a transactional relationship. In fact, this would be distinctly not only unromantic, but perhaps a sign that you are not really in love if you view your love simply as being a convenience. They do some, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And at this point, it might be pleasant. It might even be a, you know, a sexual relationship of convenience or something like this. But fundamentally, it misses that subjective destitution that comes with love, that being subject to someone, the fall, if you will. And so being in love is the process or the pass, uh, the process by which one goes from interactive relations to interpassive relations. And don't get me wrong, interactive relations are a lot more practical in many ways. You wouldn't want to have interpassive relations with most people. It would be distinctly, uh, distinctly impossible. Uh, let's say that you woke up, w woke up one day and you went to your local coffee shop and they said, okay, you know, I'm going to make you a cappuccino. Instead of simply paying for your cappuccino, you would, be say, you would say, hey, do you want to move in with me? And 10 years from now, I'm going to be this great artist and I'll pay you back for your cappuccino. Like, it's not going to work that way. And so how do you make interpassive relationships work? What is the essence or the core of love that allows this charade to continue, this deeply impractical uh, relationship or aspect of love? Well, this is where one can come to what Zizek, borrowing from Brecht, calls the third thing, uh, die dritte Sache. The actual poem from Brecht isn't so much about lovers as it is about parents and children, but Zizek adopts the central principle of the third thing, and I would stick with that. So what is the third thing? Well, ironically, when I've made videos before about the third thing, a lot of people have asked me what is the first thing and what are the second things, so let me start with that. The first and the second things are simply the two participants in the relationship, the two people who are in love with each other. So partner number one and partner number two, those would be the two things. The third thing is the, the cause. It is the idea that they commit themselves to. It is the glue that allows their relationship to persist. Now, in practical, somewhat cynical terms, you could say, for example, if a couple wants to divorce, but they decide to stay together for their children, then their children are the third thing. It's that which they commit themselves to, an idea that goes above and beyond their love. But fundamentally, every couple has a third thing. Ironically, it could even be that the third thing is the idea of being a couple as such. You are so accompanied, so accustomed to being a couple, and you're so used to being together that you can't properly imagine what life would be like without them. And so the thing that you both become loyal to <clears throat> above and beyond each other is the very idea of being a couple. It's also why Freud once referred to the creation of the couple as the most monstrous, the most monstrous invention of modernity, which wasn't to say that he was advocating polygamy. What he was trying to say is that the idea of the couple is never something that you start out with. Instead, the couple is a kind of societal, societal, societally generated concept. It's like couples who learn to rehearse their origin story for other couples at dinner parties. Here we have something that is both deeply true to who they are. It's a very intimate experience, but it's also a kind of staged rhetorical societal ritual by which you demonstrate to each other that you are a couple by means of being able to tell your origin story in a couple-like fashion. <clears throat> which isn't to say it's not enjoyable. It's not a criticism. Again, this is something I really have to emphasize in each and every lecture that most of these philosophical and theoretical critiques are not normative criticisms. It's a, a very quick aside, but to, to, il to illustrate this, uh, a, if you look today at movie reviews, for example, as soon as a movie becomes ranked according to zero to five stars, we're in the world of normative analysis. A normative analysis has two central poles, good or bad. Zero stars, bad. Five stars, amazing masterpiece, triumph, which seems to be the, the common sort of euphemism for pretty good movie these days. This is a normative criticism. A critique, on the other hand, is by its very nature not 
normative. A critique looks at the structural mechanisms by which something comes to exist, but that in technical terms, it is also the critique of ideology, which is the critique of the hidden form in the, uh, the hidden content in the form itself. Now, this is of course very abstract and difficult and not something very intuitive, but to explain it very simply, what critique does is that it doesn't examine the thing in isolation. It examines it in relationship to other things and to its quote unquote mode of production. To go back to movies, let's say that you're watching a Tarantino movie or a Christopher Nolan movie. You might re relate it to other movies that it is referring to or the time in which it was made or the politics or social situation it's commenting upon. As soon as you start engaging in these ideas, you are in the realm of critique. You are no longer in the realm of normative judgment. Hence also why you could take a movie which most people consider to be normatively not very good, like, I don't know, the second Transformer movie or something, and nevertheless make really interesting critical observations about it if you use it for critique. It's also why many philosophers, for example, like Slavoj Žižek, enjoy talking about popular cinema because many movies that are objectively or normatively quote unquote bad can nevertheless be deeply revealing and insightful when it comes to making critical arguments about the nature of society and life, etc. Um, the reason I'm explaining this is I think there can be sometimes a little bit of confusion about this for beginners. Um, and I used to see this at university. A normative critique is therefore something that ranks something from good to bad. The political equivalent of this, if you look, for example, at the Nazis, was to say something that uh, something was healthy uh, or something was sick, right? And if something was healthy, it was good for the nation, it was an emblem of loyalty and honor and the family, etc. And if it were, if it was sick, it was something that was feminine or deranged or, you know, it was this, this very deeply reactionary framing of good versus bad and what, what is good for the nation and bad for the nation. This is also why I believe that all normative analysis, precisely because it pretends to be objective truth, uh, therefore always masks underlying, if you will, power structures uh, and, and often a reactionary sentiment. That the very desire to label movies or art, or for that matter, people as being good or bad is something deeply problematic, even if it appears, or precisely because it appears to be objective in nature. And please keep this in mind for any objective review of anything. A movie, a piece of music, is that these are subjective opinions that are being presented to you as objective fact. <clears throat> now, to go back to the idea of a relationship, when Freud therefore says that the, the couple is this monstrous entity, speaking of movies, if you want to see the couple as a monstrous entity, you could watch uh, David Lynch's Eraserhead, which is a beautiful adaptation of this idea. Um, the couple is a monstrous entity, not because the couple is bad or false or fake. It's not a normative critique. It's the way in which the couple is created societally, that couples learn to present themselves and that they have to be the couple. They start referring to themselves as the royal we, etc. And so what appears a deeply, strictly speaking, intimate experience, then the experience of love, therefore reveals itself to also have an outward component, the societal components which doesn't make it less of a love, it's just one of the complications of love, is that one learns to become a couple and present oneself as a couple, uh, legally, financially, personally, emotionally, or otherwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, I know we went a little bit off topic there, but hopefully that was, that was uh, helpful. Now, to go back to the idea I was trying to explain, which is Slavoj Žižek's idea of the third thing. This means that any couple requires a third thing, something that keeps them together, a cause. Zizek's argument, which is characteristically uh, leftist here, is to argue that the ultimate form of love, the ultimate ethical form of love, as he puts it, is therefore when one has revolutionary love or love for revolution, that one finds within one's relationship an absolute commitment, a kind of combined subjective destitution, not to each other, but to a political cause. Of course, when I say political here, it doesn't have to mean you want to become president, <laughs> um, which wouldn't be very revolutionary. Instead, it's a, okay, tangent. I'm gonna very, very quickly get off topic here. Speaking of presidents and couples, there's a great anecdote about Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, where um, uh, 
Michelle Obama and Barack Obama were supposed to be in a cafe somewhere. And um, I want to tell the story properly. And at a certain point, uh, Michelle Obama points out um, another man and they say hello. And Obama says, who's that? Michelle Obama says, that used to be my boyfriend before we were together. And at that point, Barack Obama laughs and he says, well, it's good that you married the president and you didn't marry him. At which point Michelle Obama turns to Barack and says, no, you have it the wrong way around. If I'd married him, he would be the president right now. <laughs> and I find that a really beautiful anecdote, a really beautiful story um, about the creation and the creation myth of the couple. Um, anyway, uh, to go back to Zizek's point, Zizek's point about the third thing and the ethical love of revolution doesn't have to be political in an overtly political sense. For example, if both of you are artists and you're committed to your art, if both of you are uh, writers and you're committed to your crafts, then in a sense what you're trying to do is you're trying to make your love revolve, not around just how do I buy a nice house or how do I, you know, aspire to the classic standard bourgeois definition of a good life, which, which is not a bad thing, but you don't aspire to that. Instead, you aspire to give yourself completely to something, to give yourself completely to your art. And there, and you've, I think many people there and find great love, they find great satisfaction. Um, of course, they can also find great pain. I don't want to generalize here. I immediately had a couple of examples about artist relationships that don't work out. Um, often, of course, the case is that one of the partners will support the other partner as they continue to create their art. But this doesn't have to be a bad thing necessarily. Um, I was reading a passage from uh, Monet, the French, uh, the French artist Monet, who you may know from the famous uh, Water Lilies at Giverny. Um, he has a beautiful, haunting letter that he wrote after his first wife, Camille, passed at the age of 34. And I think it was 34, 32. And what happened was that uh, she'd had multiple abortions and uh, presumably had incurred injury and eventually a form of uh, debilitating illness. And on her deathbed, or in fact, after she had died, so after Monet was with her corpse, he was looking at her. And here's something deeply curious occurs, something which would be easily defined as being quite morbid, which is their entire life had been dedicated to art. In fact, his entire early career had been started by portraying her, uh, the famous lady in a green dress, which was the first piece that he had presented at the salon, which was a hit and Zola described as being the only painting that had uh, real life and blood in it. Um, ironic, of course, considering that Monet would become to known, come to be known as an impressionist, itself a derogatory term at the time. And so the fact that Zola praised him for being a realist is funny. But aside from that, he and his wife had spent his entire, their entire short lives dedicated, up until then, dedicated to their art, to their craft. And so while he was looking at her uh, in her deathbed, instead of simply looking at her, he found himself looking at the light as it played upon the covers that were wrapped around her. And you can look up this painting online, if you will. It's a really striking, somewhat very sad painting where Monet found himself sketching and then painting the corpse of his wife. And he wrote a letter to a friend, which we still have, in which he said that he felt in this moment like there was something deeply wrong with him, that his and their commitment to art was so overwhelming and strong that it seemed to go against the most basic human impulses of grief and the inability to work. The way that he described himself was like a beast grinding at the mill, that he had a compulsive need to paint his wife, both in life and now in death. <clears throat> and on the one hand, you could look at that painting and you could say to yourself, well, this is a horrible thing. She's being exploited. First, she was exploited as his muse. Then 
you know, this led to her death, and now she's being exploited after death. Her image, her likeness is being reproduced, which of course is a foreshadowing of contemporary debates about people's digital likeness existing on beyond their death. How could you have a painting of your dead wife? And at the same time, we could also make the exact opposite argument, that here we have the highest form of ethical love. That what made their love, their willingness to persist in their art, despite the poverty and the rejection that came with it, was this commitment to a principle. And that therefore, the best way for Monet to honor her, both in life and after her death, was to paint her, was to reproduce her, to have her live on forever. And that ironically, if you want to get to the essence of Monet's obsession, which is the obsession with light and how light changes on people, living, breathing people, we find here the sort of morbid, sublime, ideal rendering, the logical conclusion of his fascination with light above people, which is how does the light in the bedroom change as it glances upon her now pallid face, her corpse. It's a very dark painting, but if you will, and if you will indulge me, also a deeply romantic painting, uh, almost a gothic painting. Perhaps this is the highest form of ethical or revolutionary love, is to have an ideal or a third thing that one, commit one commits oneself to so completely that one does so even after death. So to my mind, it's sad, but it's also very romantic. You can look it up. Uh, highly recommend looking it up. It's, uh, it's quite stunning. <clears throat> uh, I thought about posting it to my fine art substack, but then I worried that it would be too upsetting for people. Um, and so I thought I'd tell you about it instead, and you can choose whether or not you would like to look at the picture. I like the idea that art could still be upsetting and beautiful and sad at the same time. I hope you agree. <clears throat> now, okay, so, so here we have again this third thing, the thing that you commit yourself to completely, the thing that holds the couple together. Therefore, once again, the idea of falling in love, the idea of the couple isn't simply about the, you know, two people who are perfectly compatible, who find each other and they go and, you know, eat a lot of ice cream together and have great jobs and reproduce. Here we have the idea of the couple, once again, as two people who align themselves around not just a common cause, but something which they can give themselves to completely. If you will, this is the double fall, the double fall that occurs within love. First, the fall into love the fall into the other. It's also why the French psychoanalyst Lacan says that what we love is the lack in the other. We find ourselves in that lack. But then the second fall is the fall that the couple experiences, by which the couple falls in love with something that defines the couple. Now, for some people, it becomes the tautologically uh, mirroring gesture of the couple that falls in love with the idea of love itself which can often, personally, I believe, can be a dangerous thing. In the same way that if, you're, if, you, if you make the same tautological error when you're first falling in love, let's say that you're falling in love, you think you're falling in love, but in fact, you're falling in love with the idea of love itself, then it might be that it doesn't actually matter who you're falling in love with. You simply want to be with someone. And so a couple who falls in, the, in love with the idea of being the perfect couple, who lives to represent themselves as the perfect couple on the internet, for example, Therefore, may well experience love, but they've also made themselves slave to this idea of the perfect couple that they then have to continuously reproduce. Therefore, they become like the automata of their own reproduction of that which perhaps is not there in the first place. Again, love can take on many different guises and forms, and I don't mean to normatively imply that some are worth more than others. It's a complicated process that is perhaps the only thing that truly matches the complication of what it means to be alive in the first place. Um, and so this double fall that occurs in love, the fall into love, but then the fall into the couple, the fall into finding that third thing around which you orient yourself, is part of Bajou's idea of a truth event. And this is where the final part of the tr love is a truth event has to be explained. Bajou says that love requires what he calls fidelity to the event. And fidelity to the event, fidelity is simply being another word for loyalty, loyalty to the event, means that events are happening around you all the time. It's just that you don't necessarily see them. You don't recognize them. Here we have a difference between Badieu and, for example, the latest Spider-Man movie, Across the Spider-Verse. 
And across the Spider-Verse, we have so-called canon events, like the death of Uncle Ben, that are not allowed to, that have to pass. In fact, if you prevent them from happening, it means that the entire multiverse or whatever Spider-Verse starts unraveling. At least that's the premise of the film. However, the true authentic act of freedom in that movie is precisely to disavow the canon event, to not simply follow the logic of a story that is already being told for you. For Bajira, on the other hand, events are happening all the time. Canon events, if you are, happening around you all the time. It's just that you don't recognize them. And they only become a canon event once you subjectively step into them, once you have what he calls fidelity or loyalty to the event. And the same is true for love. Like, strictly speaking, you could probably, you're more likely to fall in love with someone if you go out into the street and you meet someone than you are to fall in love if you just stay at home. Although the internet has, of course, entirely radicalized this, this idea. Perhaps today you could be more likely to fall in love online than you are in the real world. It's entirely possible. But it requires some form of subjective investment. And it's this paradoxical situation, therefore, which is that you can't force it, but at the same time you have to create the opportunity or you have to put yourself in a situation by which it might occur. Now, for Badieu, this is again where Badieu reveals himself. I mean, he doesn't hide it, but where, again, the revolutionary aspect comes to pass, is that a truth event and having fidelity to the event, therefore, has a revolutionary aspect, which is that love is a kind of cause that you have to recognize yourself in. It's like you're going through your day and you're just fine the way you are. The world makes sense. You're productive, you're happy, etc. Perhaps a bit lonely. One day you meet someone and in order to be with them, you have to radically upend the logical coordinates, the incentive structures that previously governed your life. That therefore love is always a revolution in disguise, a subjective revolution which brings us to the more sort of revolutionary attitude towards love, that a revolution, whilst clearly having a violent component, because it is the complete disruption of everything that was and the power structures that were, is therefore a revolution that mirrors the subjective destitution of love, that one falls into revolution in the way one falls into love. In fact, that love is a form of revolution on the level of the subjective consciousness and vice versa. And that therefore a revolution is fidelity to the event, except fidelity to a political event, that one recognizes in a specific historical situation that it is up to oneself to act, that one cannot simply let other people do it for one, that oneself has to do the right thing. And again, you could even see this in like popular movies, like a truism, which aren't revolutionary in a sense, but it's the moment in which you learn your true nature is the moment in which you realize that you feel compelled to act. You have to take action. It's Kant's, du Kant's then resolvist. You can because you must. And the event therefore presents itself to you as a necessity, which is also a contingency. It appears to happen accidentally, and yet it could only ever have occurred in that exact way, in that exact moment. And it is only unlocked if you recognize it for what it is and therefore make the subjective investment. You step into it and therefore unlock its necessity. Without the subjective encounter, therefore, it remains, strictly speaking, contingent. But when you activate it, when you accept it, when you embrace it, when you have fidelity to the event, you have therefore created the necessity of it. And here we're back at the, back at the philosophical paradox of freedom and necessity. Necessity is usually experienced as the opposite of freedom. And yet the philosophical argument that Bajo makes, that Zizek will later make as well, building upon Kant, is that freedom is the highest realization of necessity. That freedom is when one reaches a certain point in one's life and one understands that one has no other choice but to act in this way. That it appears to one as absolutely crucial that one do this thing. That is the highest form of ethical freedom. The example that Zizek uses, I've explained before, is to say, let's say you're walking down the street and somebody passes out and everybody just walks by. Except you don't. For some reason, you decide that you are not going to be one of the people who walks by. And so you call an ambulance. And later, somebody might ask you, what compelled you to act? When everybody else just walked by, what compelled you? And the answer would probably be, well, can't you see? I had no choice. I had no choice but to act. And this is the highest form of ethical freedom, something which you do that sets you apart, but it is 
retroactively experienced as you had absolutely no choice. You had to do it. Du kannst, denn du sollst, this Kant's ethical maxim about freedom, therefore. And the same thing comes with love. Love, to some extent, is a subjective choice. You can choose not to fall in love. You can choose to run away. You can choose to move to another city. You can choose to, you can choose to treat them badly so that hopefully they'll run away for you, which unfortunately is something people do. Or you can choose to act upon this inner necessity and retroactively to say, well, why did I fall in love? Well, it's because I had to. I had no choice. Can't you see that I'm not, a, that I'm not in charge of this decision? And therefore, within love, we find mirrored, both on a maximalist scale and in a minimalist theater of the self, the paradox, the properly philosophical paradox of the contingency of necessity and freedom experienced as necessity. That is Alain Badiou's theory of the event. Thank you guys so much. I hope that that has been uh, instructive, insightful. I hope that it's given you little nuggets that you'd like to pursue in your own reading and study. If you'd like to access reading recommendations, which I post every day, you can find those on Instagram if you are a $5 paying subscriber. If you've joined this live stream and you'd like to become a subscriber, please consider doing that today. It's a small, it's a small thing, but it makes a big difference in allowing me to keep hosting these open access live stream lectures. If you are a patron uh, and you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Thank you for believing in this project from day one. And if you'd like to become a patron and access my ebook, Introduction to Zizek, as well as the ad-free lecture downloads that you can listen to anywhere as a podcast and many other community perks, please consider going to www.patreon.com forward slash Jemeline and Julian. I'll put that in the description. And for Instagram, I will type it in the comments section real quick. That is www.patreon.com forward slash Jemeline and Julian. If you're wondering who Jemeline is, that Jenlene is my life, the love of my life, my partner, uh, and together we dedicate ourselves to the third cause of the arts, of culture, education, trying to share this space with others and trying to inspire others to keep educating themselves. So that is www.patreon.com forward slash Jenlene and Julian. Thank you so much for watching today. And if you are a patron, then you can look forward to the bonus podcast, which I will be recording in about 10 minutes. And for everyone on Instagram, thank you so much for joining me. I am so incredibly grateful that you have chosen to start your week in likewise fashion. Uh, apologies for being in my pajamas still. There's also a very, very cute cat out in the road. Uh, I've I've been trying to make friends with. I posted a video of her to my stories. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. All right, have a wonderful week, everyone. Hope that you are filled with inspiration and learning. See you soon. Thank you everybody for watching on YouTube and I will see you soon in the bonus podcast.